read this, uh, this short study on, on submission, Christian submission. <clears throat> Tonight, if you turn your Bibles to page 181, 1 Peter, we'll pray before we read. Lord gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. We praise you today for the blood that you shed for our sins, God. We thank you and praise you that you'll come and, and bless us tonight, that your word will be out, that, that we may be able to receive that word and uh, apply it to our life as we walk out here with understanding and, uh, and wisdom to apply it to it, Father. We ask you to forgive us our sins tonight, God, that we know that that we sin every day and we need to be in your fellowship to get those blessings, God. We ask all this in your, your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Page 181 in our text. <clears throat> we'll read uh, 11 through 20 here. It says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which, wars, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors, as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that, that they, doing right by you, right, you may silence the ignorance of the foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For, for this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do not, or when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. The first subject we're going to talk about is, is uh, verse 11 and 12 under Christian conduct as believers. It says, Beloved here. So he's talking to who? He's talking to the Christians. He's talking to you and me. He's addressing them, and that's and if you notice, Paul used that term quite frequently in all his writings as well. Beloved, to indicate that he's talking to the the Christians. I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds. As they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, aliens and strangers here indicates that we well. Actually, we talked about that in the very beginning of this book when Peter addressed the Christians the first time there. That we we are not at home here. Our home, our citizenship, is in heaven. Philippians tells us, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. So our citizenship, or our home, is in heaven, and that's what we're eagerly waiting for. That's why he refers us to as aliens and strangers, because we are amongst the world, or we are amongst the pagans, that, that their home is not heaven. And he's letting us know that we don't mix, or we are not the societies here, uh, is the Christians. We, we are amongst the world, but it's very important that we realize where our home is. Our home is in heaven. Our citizenship is anchored in heaven forever. That's a blessing for one. Abstain from fleshly lust, he tells us. Abstain is, uh, means hold oneself constantly back from. So he's not saying just one time or just stop something one time. He's saying obtain. He's saying constantly hold yourself back from lust, is what he says from fleshly lust because it wages war against yourself. When you, when you, you know, when you, I guess, uh, feed the desires of the flesh, that wages war with what is right. And we know what is right by the word of God. So when we, well, what Peter is saying here is, is 
abstain or hold back, continuously hold back all those desires that you have to do something, you have to continuously hold it back. And he uses lust here, which lust, I got a little definition of it. Lust is an appetite or a desire. Am I echoing? <clears throat> okay. I'll just preach right through that. Uh, and that's a human nature, or that's a human quality that we have in the flesh, that desire. That desire that is, that, that is not the actual sin. It's the acting out those lusts, of taking those desires, and we act on those, and we commit those things that we desire that's against the will of God. That's why, that's why he's telling us, stay away from that. In 1 Peter 1.14, he says, As obedient children, do not conform to the former lust which, you, which were yours in your ignorance. Before we were saved, we probably fed our appetite or fed our desire through all the lust and all the things that we did before we were saved without really even understanding how bad we were hurting God in some of the sins that we were doing. We were ignorant to the Word. We were ignorant to God. But now he's saying, I have delivered you from that. I've hung my son on a cross to deliver you from that. Don't go back it. Back it. Don't go back there. Because that was your former lust. Don't go back. He's already brought you forward. It says, keep your behavior. Next verse. It says, keep your behavior excellent among, amongst the Gentiles. Now, Christians should obtain themselves from a sinful lifestyle, he's saying. But you know what? We also should think about the world looking at you as Christians, looking at your lifestyle individually with the title Christian on it. Now that's why he's saying, he's saying keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. He's saying, remember, they're looking at you. They're judging you. They're seeing everything you do right and wrong. And most of the time, what do we usually hear? Is when we do something wrong. Now Christians, we stumble. We trip, we fall, we sin. The Bible tells us we sin every day. Now, he's telling us to, to remember that. Then he goes on that talks about, they, uh, what is it, slander you as evil doers that they may because of your good deeds. Observe them. They slander you not because of anything good that you do. They slander you because of the good that's in you, the light that's in you. We don't conform to the world. We try to get the world to conform to the light that's in, that's in us. And the light that's in us is Jesus Christ. And we should show that light as that. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify the Father that's in heaven. It doesn't say glorify Roger because the works that Roger did. No. They ought to see the light in your life and see God working in it. And a lot of times... A lot of times, if, if you know somebody, I'll use myself as an example, before I was saved, if you knew me before I was saved, and you know me now, five years later, you can say, I can see the light. You know? Because one thing I, I told many times now is that I wouldn't help anybody before. I had no desire to help out someone moving, or putting a roof on their house, or, or you know, going over and Seeing their dog's pregnant. Oh, by the way, Chris's dog's pregnant. Everybody know that? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I had no desire to do that. I was out for me. That's the way I was raised. That, that was who I was. You know what? God took that person and kicked that person or that attitude to the side. And when he came in, I wanted to do his will, and his, his, his things that he wanted me to do. And those works ain't mine. Ephesians uh, 2.10 says they were, all our good works was laid out before. And we walk in his footsteps. See, all those good works is he's done. We're just doing them in his footsteps. So it's a blessing to know that God is in us and his light is what should be shining. Because we can't take no credit for any good we do at all. And he goes on, <clears throat> he goes on and says, glorify, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, this is where I really, really struggled on this. This term was used in Luke 19. And, and what visitation they were referring to was his uh, crisis first visitation back. And the Jews 
rejecting him. Now, the majority thinks that this term means that the Lord's, the Lord's returning, at when, uh, when the Lord returns uh, to call up his uh, children in the air. But the Greek kind of breaks uh, verse 19 down to a time of gracious visitation. So, really, this term is a good thing. It's, it's used in a good sense. Uh, God in the day of visitation. It's used in a good sense. The majority understands the verses uh, as that. Now, there's a minority that understands verse 12 as a negative or an unpleasing sense, you know, as a punishment sense. But um, really, if you view it as, uh, as study and context, the third view is, is that the day the Lord visits you on the day of your salvation. Now, this term was used both in, in 19 and in uh, verse 12 here, or uh, Luke 19, and uh, also in verse 12 in Peter. But con remember, context determines meaning here. In Luke, that phrase was talking about Christ's first appearance when the Jews rejected him. That's what he was talking about, that they rejected me in my first visitation in Luke. And this one's talking about the... Well, let's read verse 12 real carefully again. It says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Okay, so it's an action. So that the thing and they which slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them. Glorify God in the day of visitation. So he's talking about the good things that they see in you. And when God visits them, they'll glorify God for their salvation. So I don't know why in the commentaries really blew that little segment up. But I figured I'll cover it since I was on the text. Now I lost my spot. Okay. Now... Verse 12, oh, I already did verse 12, sorry. Word number 2, I mean 12, 2. Christian conduct as citizens. Let's look at this. Let's read verse 13, 14. It says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Submit here, the word submit is to place under or subject or obey. Submission and submitting, those actual Greek terms, which we'll talk about all, through all these, was a military term. It was a very firm, uh, aggressive term that you did submit. You didn't have much uh, uh, say in that. So he tells us to submit ourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. An institution is create, can be translated as creation or authority. Now, every authority position that we have that's been created has been created by God. Now, we submit to the kings and governors, as his text says back then, well, we submit to local authorities and higher authorities. God ordained all authorities, and we submit to them. Turn to page 127 in the rest section. We'll read Romans 13, 1 and 2. And we'll back up and talk a little bit about the submission of kings and such. It says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And, who's the, and those who exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So, all authority has been given from God to those positions. Now, we obey God's laws first. Let's make that clear. Because when people, says, when people think of authority, they think of laws and someone telling them what to do. That's the first thing we think of when we think of an authority position. You know? And we pray for, for Daryl now because he's under Scott, and we know Scott's authority is, you know, get done now! Yeah. But we'll remember you, Daryl, in prayer. But... The, but the law is first. Hey, you was bad on me Sunday, so I'm back at you. <laughs> the laws that we obey first is God's laws, God's commandments, God's will first. Long as these laws, the laws that of the land or the laws or the authorities or direction that the people that you are subject to or, or you submit to under authority, as long as those directions are not contrary or contradict the word of God, or a harsh way, you know, 
you follow them. If you know, you got to use a little bit of common sense. They always used one in the military about when not to obey our commanders. They said if he told you to go and move your tent, and you move your tent, and it's in the middle of a uh, tank trail, you know, use a little bit of common sense. You know, when you, you know, reject or, or say I don't want to follow that order, use a little bit of common sense. You ask and kind of instruct. Now Daniel, this leads me up to an example. Daniel, remember chapter one, first first chapter one through fourteen. Daniel didn't want to eat the king's food or the meat and the wine. He didn't rebel. He didn't cause an uprising. He didn't cause, um, you know, a gang war or whatever. What he did, he talked to the guard and he asked the guard, hey, I really don't want to eat the meat. I really don't want to drink the wine. Um, We prefer to eat the vegetables. And the guard really didn't want to do that, but he said, test us. You know, so he negotiated another way around a law, but still got the same thing out. So what that tells us is we give our authority or we give our uh, submission to the authorities that we're under. But if it's anything that will put yourself in harm or if it's anything that is contradictory to God, you need to approach him in a reasonable and understanding manner. Paul went to the officer and, and just, or not Paul, but Daniel went to the officer and talked to him about, you know, about the food issue. Because he knew that under the law, he wasn't supposed to do eat the meat and the, and the wine, but he wanted to uh, follow God's ordinance, so he talked to him, And they made a deal, and it worked out. So that's a lesson to us for any authorities that we may be under, that, you know what, if it ain't working, don't rebel. Don't, don't, don't go and cause all kinds of trouble at work just because you didn't approach them in a reasonable, understanding manner and talk about the situation. Let's move on to verse 15. It says, For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silent the ignorance of foolish men, act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. The will of God. Pierre tells us, do right by all the ways that God teaches us, and that's by his word. And we can silence the ignorance of the foolish men. Not by opposing them, not by causing riots, but by showing them, talking to them in a manner that's right by God. 16 says, act, act as free men. We don't abuse our freedom that Christ gave us. We don't mishandle our liberties that he gives us. And that's the freedom to express our, our beliefs, that's a freedom to, to speak, that's a freedom, all freedoms that we ever have. It, he doesn't want us to abuse those. Paul kind of talks about this freedom in Galatians. He says, for you were called to freedom, brethren, and only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. He's saying, don't show your Christianity one way and getting people convinced that, oh, he's a Christian, he's that, then do something evil or do something against those people, and or be dishonest. A good example would be being dishonest. Lie to them about something, and they're going to believe you because you've always said, well, I'm a good Christian, and I'm a Christian. He's saying don't use that freedom to mislead people. Don't use your, your Christianity as a title that people go expect a good thing out of you or expect you not to lie, then you turn around and lie. He says don't cover, he says, don't cover yourself with, with that. He says, it, well, actually this covering is really... Translate, could be translated as a veil. And see, a veil, you can still see through a veil. So when you try to cover up your sins, you know what? It's going to seek you out. They're going to come back on you. So we as Christians, we shouldn't be using any leverage at all to be dishonest or to deceive somebody by them thinking that you're going to do what you said you do because you're a good Christian you're this, and not do it. That's deceiving. He doesn't want us to use that freedom uh, to deceive people at all. To sum up the citizenship here, that we should be acting as Christians amongst the world, he hits four points. He hits four points here. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, honor all people. Honor means respect, value, you know, esteem. You know, we respect all people. 
not only believers, but also unbelievers. We treat, you know, a Christian with respect. We treat non-Christians with respect, too. That famous saying, you know, you know, treat on the others as you want to be treated. That's true. And, and he wants us to honor all people, respect all people. How do you expect to be a witness? How do you expect to be a light to sinners or to unbelievers that's in sin when, when you're not respecting them? When you're not showing that love or showing that light and you're, you know, you're kind of looking down on them or talking down on them then turn around and, you know, talk to a Christian all respectful. That's not showing very much love to that person. That's not showing Christ. Christ came for us. He says that he came for the sinners. He came for, for, uh, for our redemption. Then, then he goes on and says, love the brotherhood. Now, we respect all people. We respect Christians and non-Christians. But he wants us to have a bond. Remember back in the first part of chapter 2, we talked about this love, this, uh, this flail love and agape love. And he, he, and he was expressing that he wanted to have a strong brotherly love within the Christians. He's saying that again here. We as Christians, we should have a strong bond between brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be able to come to church and be, you know, we should be able to fellowship with one another and see one another at church and take that same relationship. The reason I'm on this point because I came from a church that on one day when they all meet, they shake hands, love one another, did not see another person for another month. That's not what he's talking about here. He's saying when you're here today and we, you love and shake each other's hand and fellowship, take it outside the door. Take it through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Fellowship with other brothers and sisters as well. Have a bond with them. In this church, since I've been here, I see a great passion for love amongst the brothers and sisters. And that's what pulls, well, that's what pulled me in. Because when you have Christians that's willing to come out to your house and move you after being up for 38 hours, that's a love. When you got brothers and sisters that's willing to come into the church together on Saturday and put furnaces and paint and clean, when you got brothers and sisters that's willing to come together and go camping for a weekend, enjoy one another's fellowship, that's a church I want to be a part of. That's a Christian family I want to be in. Because I know I would have a brother and sister there to lay my head on when I need it. Or to give me a hand when I ask for it. That's the brotherly love. That's what we should have in the church. And he's expressing that to these people. Now he goes on to saying, fear God. Now we, I think we had a whole big section in first, uh, the first chapter on fearing God. Fear is not the terror of fear. Not the horrible fear. It's the awe, the reverence. The, the respect again. That's that word respect again. In verse, uh, I think it's 17, 117 is where it tells us to address the Father who is impartially judges us to fear him. Now, that fear, that, that turns us into, into someone that, that gives all of our respect to God because, because fear is an attitude. Humility. I used the definition last time uh, when we went over verse 17, that the fear of the Lord is an attitude of humility and the beginning of wisdom. When we fear God in a sense of respect and awe, then we give him everything and we, and we, we humble ourselves, and that's the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs tells us, fearing of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One. So he's hitting the third point very strong too. We give that total respect and awe to God. The fear also, we made this point back in verse 17, fear also motivates a Christian to stay out of trouble. It motivates Christians because once you, once you be, uh, become a Christian and, and you devote your life to learning God and reading His Bible, and once you start reading and, you, and God starts revealing things to you, as you grow, as you grow every day, he reveals and reveals and reveals. And once you reveal so much and you give him that respect that he's due, you know what? You're not going to step out into something because you know what? You're going to say, man, I just read that a couple weeks ago. You know what? I know what God says when I step out. 
and I don't want to step out. I don't want to do that. So you turn from it. So wisdom is applied to your life when you do those things. So the word of God stands true throughout, throughout the whole thing. Now, honor, honor the king. We respect office of authorities. Now, these office of authorities is pretty wide. It starts right with the parents. I'm not going to get on the big parent issue, but it starts right with the parents. If you teach your children to respect you because you are an authority, God gives you your children for a blessing. You are an authority of a position. You're in charge. So that position as parents is authority position. The church. There's different authorities in the church. Now, we respect the pastors, but you know what? It goes up beyond that as well in the church. We ought to give the, the, respect, the respect that's due to each pastor in each level that they're at. You know? And we also give respect for each teacher, each Sunday school teacher. The children should respect each one. They should respect the, the nursery attendants. Anybody that's in a position of authority, you give respect not only to that position, but to the, those people as well. Police, the mayor, Scott will pray for you. <laughs> the mayor, Scott's boss, so submit. I'm just kidding. Uh, governor, the Senate, all the way up to the White House is where our authorities lies, where our authorities are in this country. And not only are they, I guess, big authority positions, but, well, the schools, schools has teachers that children should learn that you have to respect or, or give reverence to those positions because they're in authority for a reason. And we read, we read chapter uh, 13 Romans that all authority is given um, by God. Number three, Christian conduct as servants. I'm going to try to get through this, this point here, hopefully. All right, servants, be submissive to your master with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Once again, Daryl, we'll, we'll pray for you, okay? <laughs> I'm busting hard on Scott tonight. Servants means household or domestic servants or hired servants. These wasn't slaves that was never paid or never uh, rendered reference for their services. It was a hired servant, servant, servant as well. Submissive. Once again, this is, this is a, a strong term, means to place under or subject or obey to. Servants must, must submit to their boss and their authorities. And what's sad is scripture says good or bad. Once again, Daryl will pray for you. So, <laughs> he's going to kill me later. But any, any position that has authority, the scripture says good or bad, you know what? It's not so much that you respect that individual, but you respect and you give the honor and you give the position, the authority position, that due respect. Now, always can you really give the respect to the person. Because if anybody can think of a president some time ago recently that, you know, we gave authority, we gave respect to that authority position, but maybe not so much to the person, you know. So we have to understand and we have to know what God's word says and how to guide our life when someone is in a position that makes wrong decisions or misguided uh, information or whatever, that we know and we have the discernment to, to change or, or, or make the wise decision. As for servants, as for servants, slaves, uh, let's see, First Timothy tell, tells us all who, I lose my mic, all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own master as worthy as all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will be spoken against. Those who have, have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren but must serve them all the more. Go ahead, turn to page 153. We'll get this last section out of the way. Ephesians 6, 5 talks about slaves, but we're also going to go right into not only the slaves be submissive and respect, bosses, masters, you got to respect your servants as well. We're going to read right into that. 
says Ephesians 6, 5. It says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good and render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Now, we know what a servant should be doing for a boss. Respecting, honor. Uh, Christian or non-Christian, it says. You know, we give them that respect. Now, look right down. Ephesians 6, 9 goes right into bosses. It says, And masters, do the same thing to them. He's referring to everything I just mentioned to slaves, to, to masters. This guy's telling me, keep going, keep going. And give them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Then Colossians 4 1 says, Masters, grant your servants justice and fairness, Scott, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. See, it's not just one way, because it goes right back to uh, verse, verse 17, where he says, Honor all people. Just because you're a boss don't mean you can mistreat your servants. And just because you're a servant and unruly or whatever don't mean that you can uh, mistreat your boss. It goes both ways. Remember, he says, your masters, both masters, are in heaven. The servants and the masters, their masters are in heaven. They answer to, to the one in heaven. So we don't mistreat good workers. We don't mistreat bad workers just because who they are. And when we treat these workers... Even the bad ones. When we, when we, it's hard. I know it's hard when you have workers that just absolutely will not work for you. But when you show them the respect that they should have and work with them, this is pleasing to God because you're following His will. You're following His commandment to be kind to them, not threatening. You know, not laying the hammer down just because you don't like them or whatever. That's not the relationship Christ wants us to have. Nineteen says, for for this finds favor. For if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. It's, it's not hard to face punishment sometimes when you do something wrong and you're guilty and you know it and, and you know, you do the crime, you do the time, you know? You endure that a little bit easier because you know you did something wrong. You know, when, when God sends you to the spiritual woodhouse, as we say here, and you know you're there, there's a reason, you know, that you're there and you know it. You endure that a little bit different. But it's very hard to face punishment when you're innocent for doing something that is right. When you are following the will of God, when you're following God's will, and you do something right, but it's, but it's not right in the sight of men or the world, and they condemn you for it, or you, or you suffer persecution for it, it takes a little bit to endure that. But he says, this finds favor. This is, this is pleasing to God. This finds favor with God, he says, in the very last part. When we endure it for the glory of God, you know, he blesses us with that. You know, the most extreme example of that would be today. People across seas are dying every day for following the will of God. What are they doing? They're reading the word of God and they're dying for it because the law of the land says that they're not, they're not supposed to have it. You know? So now they're, they're enduring a punishment that's pleasing to God or the, they're, they're doing something that's pleasing to God and enduring the punishment because of it. See, that's something that's hard to do when you're following the will of God and you're still suffering for it. That's what Peter is saying. Because in the flesh, first thing we want to do is revenge anything that anybody does against us. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He seeks revenge. We don't. I didn't think I was going to get that far, but that's where our text ends tonight. I asked someone to come up and play something. I'm glad my voice, my voice uh, stayed through. I've been sick all week. But we're going, to look at, we're going to look at Jesus Christ, the living example, next. Everything we talked about tonight is, 
is, is, was really directed to and for Christians. Because guess what? We are the light. We are the people that Christ uses through his word here today, walking and showing everyone else in the world that, you know what? I can do miracles. You know? Because there's a miracle standing here. And there's probably many miracles out there. You guys could probably say, you know what? It took a miracle to even get me inside of a church house. It was a miracle that God would even save a wrench like me. You know, miracles happen because the power is in God, not in us. That's why he tells us, let our light shine because of him. And let people see that light and give him the glory for it. And we all have to do that. We'll go ahead and close and go ahead and ask everybody to bow your head. Close your eyes. Let's take a moment. And I don't know what, where, where you stand today with God. I don't know if you where anybody is. We can't look in no one's heart. We can't tell anybody that they're saved. That's solely God's work. We just provide the words and the preaching. And he does all the work. But we have three pastors here tonight. Pastor Chris and Pastor Nate and Pastor Scott that can show you by the word of God. And if you want to accept Christ tonight, they can sure help you. They can take you and show you the word of God. And if not, if you're sitting there, you're not sure where you stand tonight. And you want the church to pray for you. And you want someone else to, to, to talk to you privately. Just let us know at any time. But Christians, the time you're sitting here, think about the conduct that you have. Think about the conduct you have as a citizen in this world for Christ. Think about your conduct as a servant in your workplace or a boss in your workplace. How are you shining that light tonight, Christians? And this message, this message, message goes above and beyond just the conduct that we do, you know, just at work. It goes to the our homes with our family. And Christians pray for pray for the ones that, that's not here tonight that couldn't receive this message that you may think that you know what they should have heard this tonight because I know someone that's struggling with authority problem you know Christians ask God to help you with the, your own family your own children help them to be submissive to you and you submissive to, to your parents and be more submissive to God because he's the ultimate one that's in authority time everybody's heads down we'll go ahead and close in prayer Lord gracious Heavenly Father, we, we praise you once again tonight to, for uh, being here with us and giving us such an awesome message to, to take home with us, to apply to our life. And uh, Lord, we ask you to just bless, just bless each and every one here with this message and the ones that's listening on tape. And uh, Lord, we ask you to bless the, these upcoming messages that, that we may get this all out and, and uh, we can apply it to our life to be submissive to the ones that's in authority and especially here at the church as we are... Uh, this is where we meet as Christians. Father, we ask you to, to give us that that understanding that you want us to have out of this, God. We ask you to, to bless uh, the rest of the week and uh, bless us to return safely uh, once again, Lord. We ask all this in your precious Son's name, Jesus. Amen.